The subject I want to talk about today is the Omer or the Sviras HaOmer. And this is a period between Pesach, between Passover and Shavuos. And we're told in the Torah, the book of Leviticus, in fact, we'll read it in a few weeks. We're told that there is a mitzvah to count 49 days from the second day of Pesach until the day before Shavuos, the day before the festival that we celebrate the giving the Torah, the receiving the Torah at Sinai. And then that's the 50th day, and that's the day that we celebrate the receiving of the Torah. And the way it is formulated uh, both in the Torah and in the midst of how we count them is that there's seven weeks. Each week is comprised of seven days. So there's seven weeks of seven days. And what I wanted to do today is offer seven different ways of viewing these days, what the message is, what are the themes, what are the concepts inherent in these special days, the days of the Omer. So before we begin, let's just talk about the absolute basics. We read in Leviticus in chapter 23, it is delineating all the festivals of the year. It talks about Pesach, and then it talks about what happens on the second day of Pesach. On the second day of Pesach, there is a special offering that is brought in the temple, it's called the Karban Omer, the Omer offering. This is, again, the second day of Pesach. It is a barley meal offering. With the bringing of the barley offering, with the bringing of the Omer, you are triggering a law, namely that all new grain is now permitted. And then the verse pivots to talk about there's a commandment to count 49 days from the day that you bring the Omer, seven weeks, seven complete weeks, seven weeks of seven days. And on the 50th day, you bring a second offering called the Shtei Halechem, the two loaves of bread offering. And that is a day, of course, of Shavuos. That's the day of the giving of the Torah. So there's a certain connection here, a certain continuum between Pesach, you have the first day of Pesach, there's no Omer then. The second day of Pesach, you bring this Omer offering and you start this process of counting. You count 49 days. And then on the 50th day, you bring a second offering. And that's the second bookend of this time period, this Omer time period. That's the Shtei Alechem. That's the wheat flour loaves of bread that you bring on Shavuos. So there's a lot of things going on over here. We have this festival that begins this continuum. We have a festival that concludes it. So we have Pesach and Shavuos being connected by these days. We have, of course, the new grains being permitted. We have these offerings bookending this time period. You have the Karban Omer, second day of Pesach, the Shtei Alechem, on the day of Shavuos. And then you have this mitzvah to count the days connecting those two ends, which, of course, is an unusual mitzvah. And it's even more unusual the way it's actually done. You don't just count the days, day one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven, etc. You count the days as a standalone entity. So today is 10 days. And then you count it a second way by breaking it down into weeks and days. So today is the 10th day of the Omer, which is one week and three days of the Omer. So it's a very unusual mitzvah in general to count the days, and the way it's done is also a little bit strange. Moreover, there is a custom that is a a very ancient custom, it's a ubiquitous custom, not to shave during these times unless there is a need to, not to get married, not to make weddings, not to listen to music, because other things happen during this period, namely the death of the 24,000 scholars who were the students of Rabbi Tiva, there was this plague, there was this epidemic that swept through his students, killed them all, or almost all of them, 24,000 of them. And as a result of that, you know, the cream of the crop of the Jewish people perished during this time. And therefore, it became a time of collective national mourning. And some of the ways that we mark mourning is by withholding from things that bring us joy, like music and weddings and to adopt practices of mourning, namely to not get haircuts or to shave. So there's obviously a lot going on during these days. Like we said, there's this unusual mix of counting, the very unusual way of doing that, the timeline, the second day of Pesach till Shavuos. And we're going to offer 
seven different themes of these days, maybe we could say more accurately, seven different intersecting dimensions of these days. So the first idea is maybe the most basic insight, and that is that there's a certain intimate connection between the festival of Pesach, of Passover, and the festival of Shavuos. And the Omer is like the bridge that is connecting these two related festivals. In fact, the Ramban, one of the great commentators in the Torah, one of the great medieval sages, he writes that, you know, we have the festival of Sukkot, and you have the first days, and you have the last days, and then you have the intermediate days, the Cholomoed. And then you have Pesach. You got the first day of Pesach, second day of Pesach, we have the Seder, and then you have the last day of Pesach, the seventh day, or the eighth day of Pesach, and then you have the days in between. It's like they have bridge days, intermediate days. It's still Pesach, but it's not quite a festival. Says the Ramban, that theme applies also to the Omer. You have Passover, you have Shavuos, they're almost like one mega festival, and then you have days of the Omer, they're like the intermediate days, they're like the Cholomoed that is spanning both ends, both opposites of this mega festival. And if you think about it, the idea of Pesach is, of course, redemption, is, of course, freedom. We were slaves, and we were saved from our bondage, we became free men. But if you study the story, it's patently evident that right after the Exodus, the job is not yet completed. Of course, the easiest evidence for that is, you know, we think we left Egypt, and then seven days later, they have pursued us, and once again, we're facing off with the enemy that you told me we vanquished seven days prior. Pharaoh, of course, made a very dramatic reappearance seven days after the Exodus. And if we study the time period, the original story, Passover, Exodus, we leave. Seven days later, Pharaoh pursues. We have, of course, the standoff at the sea, the splitting of the sea. The Jews erupt into song. They get all the booty of Egypt. Three days they go without water. They end up in a place called Mara. The waters are sweetened. Moshe hits a rock and emits water from the rock. And, of course, we get some mitzvot in Mara. We get the manna. A lot of stuff are happening. But, of course, eventually, a couple of days later, 44 days after the Exodus, the nation encamps at Mount Sinai. And they spend a couple of days there preparing. And eventually, on the sixth day of the month of Sivan, they have this revelation at Sinai. So there's been an uninterrupted continuum of events from the Exodus all the way to the Sinai. And of course, at Sinai, they get the Torah. Now, the Mishnah tells us freedom exists only with Torah. So, of course, the lesson is, yes, the Jewish people were slaves and they were brought to freedom, but that happened in stages. There was the bondage in Egypt and that ended with the Exodus. And then there was a certain degree of bondage or subservience that still lingered, and then therefore Pharaoh is still pursuing them, and that gets eliminated at the sea, the splitting of the sea, and then the manna comes, and that's freeing them of other vestiges of bondage, and they are suffering a little bit, there's no water, and they have to rely on God, and there's a shedding here of various gradations and levels of bondage. And when does freedom actually complete itself? It completes itself at Sinai. The Jewish people were free, but they were freed in, in, in tiered stages. And that's this process of the Omer. It's completing what we began. The freedom began at the Exodus, but it's unfolding sequentially, first with the Pesach, first with the Exodus. And then you have the whole process of the seven weeks of the Omer, and that culminates in Shavuos at Sinai, Revelation and total freedom. Perhaps you remember in chapter 3 of Exodus, we meet Moshe as an adult, and he is coming to view his Jewish brethren. He goes to see their suffering. He defends 
the vulnerable Jews that are his brethren. He kills an Egyptian who is mistreating, who is harassing, who is oppressing a Jew. He has to flee. And eventually he marries the daughter of Yisro, the daughter of Jethro, and he is a shepherd. And he has a very dramatic experience one day with his flock at the burning bush. God tells him, okay, you're now nominated to go back to Egypt to go save your Jewish brethren from their suffering. And that begins a very long dialogue where Moshe is resisting this mantle of leadership. And he is raising objection after objection. But it's interesting. Right at the beginning of that dialogue, Moshe tells God, who am I? I'm not worthy. I'm going to go speak to Pharaoh. I'm not going to go speak to kings. I'm going to take the Jewish people out of Egypt. And Rashi, of course, breaks it down. What's happening? He's saying, I'm not worthy. The Jewish people are not worthy. It's not going to happen. And God tells him, this is verse 12 of chapter 3, the sign that this is going to be a successful mission is that when you leave, you're going to worship me on this mountain. And our sages tell us that this encounter, the encounter that begins the process of the Exodus actually happened at Sinai. And God tells him, when you leave, you're coming back here. And that, of course, should inform us that there's a very intimate link between the Exodus, freedom from Egypt, and whatever's going to happen at Sinai on the festival of Shavuos. The Sinai experience is part and parcel of the Exodus. And our sages tell us even further, Moshe tells it, takes the Jewish people out of Egypt. And of course, when you're fleeing, you're very happy that you're leaving Egypt behind, but where's the destination? Where are we heading to? And our sages tell us that Moshe tells him, okay, we're going to a mountain called Mount Sinai. And on Mount Sinai, we're going to have this commune, this encounter with God. Well, when that's, when, when's that going to happen? They ask Moshe. And he tells them at the end of 50 days. So what do they start doing? They start counting. And every day, it's a check. We're one day closer towards our destination, towards Sinai. And that's the idea of these days is the anticipation, the countdown, and the build up towards the culmination, the completion of the exodus of the freedom that's going to happen at Sinai. There's a very famous comment by the Sefer HaChinuch. We've talked about the Sefer HaChinuch in the past. That is a medieval book of unknown authorship. And what he does is he takes each mitzvah and gives us a snapshot of the mitzvah, what the basic laws are of that mitzvah, and what the basic rationale the underlying principle of why we have such a mitzvah. And he tells us that the reason why we count the Omer, the reason why we're counting days from Pesach, from Passover, to Shavuos, from Exodus to Sinai, it's because the essence of the Jewish people is Torah. The reason why the world was created is Torah. The reason why we left Egypt, the reason why we were redeemed from servitude was only to bring about Torah at Sinai. And therefore, because the essence of Jewish people and the reason why we were saved and the reason why we were elevated to our heightened stature, it's only because of Torah, which was delivered to us at Sinai. Therefore, we were commanded the second day of Pesach to start counting the days in anticipation and to elevate within us or to demonstrate within us, to manifest within us the great desire of that day. There's something very important, very powerful, very essential about the calendar of that's upcoming. There's a day, a powerful day that is soon to be with us and therefore we're so excited and we are counting the days as if, he gives the example, comparable to a prisoner who is counting the days towards freedom. There's something so powerful that's upcoming. There's something, there's something so transcendental in our immediate future 
We're so excited about it. We're counting the days. Today is day 10. Day 50, we know something really powerful is happening. And one of the questions that everyone asks is, well, doesn't it make sense to count down? If we are only solely counting towards the goal, maybe we should start at 49, count down till zero. So there's many answers to that question. Some suggest that, well, it's kind of depressing to think about how many days you have left. Oh my gosh, 49 days. It's more inspirational. It's more positive. It's more optimistic to count what you have accomplished towards that goal. That's one of the answers. There's many, many answers to this question. But a consensus principle, and this is going to bring us, I think, towards the next idea, the next theme, the next dimension of these days. A consensus principle is that these days are not days of idle anticipation, of idle awaiting. These are days that we are building towards something. We're not just counting down to our destination. The Omer, the time of the Omer, is to build ourselves, to ready ourselves for the receiving the Torah. It's different than an inmate just etching off those days in the calendar till you have freedom. You're not just killing time. You're not just eliminating obstacles before your goal. You're building towards that day. Each one of these 49 days is another rung in that ladder. And the structure of how this works, and I know we've mentioned this in the past, the Jewish people achieved a certain climax twice. The first night of Pesach, there was a revelation that was repeated at Sinai. The first night of Pesach and Shavuos has the same spiritual power. We talked about it being like as if it's one big festival that's connected with the intermediate days. On a philosophical level, there was a revelation of God at Sinai that was matched only by the revelation of God on on the first night of Pesach, on the actual night of the Exodus. But there is a fundamental difference between the first time it happened, namely the first night of Pesach, the night of the Exodus, and the second time it happened at Sinai 50 days later. The first time, it's it's temporary. It's unnatural. It's this external upswing to the highest level. The Kabbalists tell us that the Jewish people were this close from eternal damnation. The way they phrase it is that there's 49 levels of holiness and 49 levels of impurity. The Jewish people were on the doorstep of going beyond the point of no return and of condemning themselves for destruction. In the words of the prophet, they were spiritually naked. They only had the blood, so to speak, or the bloods. The blood of the Passover sacrifice, that was their one merit. And the blood of their circumcision, that was their second merit. That was the only redeeming qualities that they had. So what happens the first night, of, the first night of Pesach? A flash unleashes itself in the world. God himself, no angels, no intermediaries. He just appears. And this is such a powerful experience. All the firstborn die. They can't handle it. They are given certain tools to absorb spirituality but it burns right through them. But the Almighty passes over the Jewish people's house and they have the experience without the danger. But did they earn that experience? Did they get to that highest 50th level of holiness on their own? Did they earn it? They didn't. And therefore, after they're given a taste of what this highest level of holiness of what it's like to be taken from the 49th level of impurity and ascended to the 49th and 50th level of holiness, and they've been given that free, pro bono, unearned, unnatural. On day two of Pesach, they go back to the bottom floor. They go back to ground zero. And then over the next 49 days, step by step, rung by rung, they earn it, they build it, they... Take the steps necessary to actually become worthy of once again achieving level 50. After 49 days, they're ready to re-experience 
the same experience that they had for free on the first day of Pesach to relive it at Sinai. I heard an example. You have a father bequeathing a business empire to his son. The father's really rich, owns all kinds of business, runs a conglomerate, and it's housed in a gleaming skyscraper with 50 floors. And of course, the dad, the mogul, the tycoon, he runs operations from the nerve center all the way in the penthouse, all the way on the highest floor. And each level is a different business, different operations. The father wants to hand over the keys to the kingdom, to his son, to his heir. And this is how he does it. He says, okay, come to the 50th floor. Take the elevator up. Spend a week over here. Spend a month over here. See the big picture. Be given the corner office for free. Once you've seen what it's like, okay, time to go all the way back down to the bottom and really learn the business Really earn your stripes floor by floor. At Sinai, we have ascended floor by floor 50 floors, and we have once again gotten back to the place that we took the elevator up to on the first day of Pesach. And this explains the role of the Omer. You know, if Omer is connecting Pesach to Shavuos, you would think naturally to start from the first day of Pesach. First day of Pesach, you start counting the Omer. You start getting into that mode. The answer is no. The Omer is not merely counting days between two festivals. The Omer is about building up to once again reacquaint ourselves, recreate the scenario, the situation that was present on day one of Pesach. And I think this leads us into the second theme of these days. Of course, these days are a bridge between Pesach and Shavuos. And there's a certain internal consistency threading those two festivals. But a central theme, of course, that's related, is that these are times of preparation and anticipation. We have a principle. This is a bedrock principle of Torah philosophy. Nothing great can be accomplished without proper requisite preparation. If you want to relive the experience of the festivals, if you want to actually absorb the lesson, the takeaways of these grand days, you have to work hard to get there. If we did Pesach correctly, we experience the degree, a modicum of redemption ourselves on Pesach. Now it's time to prepare for Torah, to prepare for Shavuos, to prepare for Sinai. We have the Omer period to polish ourselves. The full name of the Omer period is called the Sefiras HaOmer, which means the counting of the Omer, or the, the days of the Sefira. Now if you listen to that word Sefira, it sounds a lot like a word called Sapphire. And in fact, in Hebrew... The gem, the sapphire, is called a sapir. Isn't it interesting, point out the commentaries, that the days of the sephira saomer, the counting of the omer, have, it sounds a lot, it reams like the sephira, the, sap, the sapir, the sapphire. And the commentaries explain. It's not a coincidence. These are days that we have to polish ourselves to become a gem worthy of Sinai. And we have 49 days to get ourselves in the zone, to get ourselves prepared, polished, ready to go for that experience to relive it. And in fact, there is a ubiquitous custom throughout these days to study Perkei Avos, to study the chapters of our fathers. This is the guidance of our forebearers. And just as we have a whole book of Genesis, before we have the book of Exodus, before we have Torah, before we have any laws, really, we have the guidance of our forefathers of Genesis to read about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and, and the illustrious antecedents, the illustrious pedigree of our nation. We have that to prepare for Exodus, for nationhood, for Torah. 
Similarly, we're going to have that same experience and we take the book, the chapters of our fathers, the book which is the guidance for ethical refinement, for polishing ourselves. We take that book and say, okay, this is going to be our guidelines to prepare ourselves, our genesis, so to speak, to prepare ourselves for Torah. And thus, the central idea, another central idea is this is the time to prepare for Sinai. And another component of that, again, another theme of the Omer, these are days of cleansing and purification. We talked about this, this the sapphire. You have a sapphire, you got to polish it, got to make sure it is gleaming. We have seven days, we have seven weeks, seven weeks of seven days. If you study the Torah, you'll find a reappearing motif. Seven days, creation. Seven days, perfection. Seven days, purification. So, for example, we have all these laws, purity and impurity, in the book of Leviticus. And almost all of them, it takes a period of seven days to be purified. You have the Nida, the Zava, the Zav, the Yoledas, the Mitzorah, all these laws of people that become impure, very draconian, complicated laws, but invariably they have seven days of renewal, seven days of purification, seven days of cleansing. And of course, that parallels the seven days of creation. When someone is impure, you don't just brush off the impurity, you recreate the new person, so to speak, in a new paradigm, in a pure paradigm. And thus, seven days of creation, seven days of purity, when someone becomes pure, they're like a new person, clean slate, brand new, square one, all the opportunities are available. What do we have with the Omer? It's not just seven days. It's seven weeks of seven days. It's seven squared. We have purity with seven days, uber duber purity, thorough cleansing, uber purging of all the sins, uber cleansing and uber preparing ourselves to be those people to stand at the foot of the mountain to be ready to experience God at Sinai. In fact, there is an interesting Mishnah in chapter 2 of the book of Idios. Uh, in fact, a very interesting book, a subject for a different discussion. But it's uh, like a random miscellaneous collection of teachings, very interesting, but the last mission of chapter 2 reads as follows. There are five things that took 12 months. The judgment of the people of the flood. The judgment of Job. The judgment of Egypt. The period from when the plagues began to the Exodus. 12 months. The judgment of Gog and Magog, which is some sort of futuristic war, 12 months. And finally, the judgment of the wicked in Gehenna, 12 months. So these five periods of judgment, each one of them takes 12 months. Says Rabbi Yochanan ben Nuri, this is a dissenting opinion. It's not 12 months. The wicked don't get judged in Gehenna for 12 months. No, they get judged from Pesach to Shavuos. Now, what does that mean? So, incidentally, I want to point out that when it says 12 months, at least according to Rashi, and that's the only comment that I've seen, it doesn't really mean just 12 months. It means it means a year, a full year. Which, by the way, the reason why when we have a deceased parent, the custom is to say Kaddish for a year. Why do we say Kaddish for our parents that, that pass away? The reason why is because this year following their passing, they're in a vulnerable state. They're potentially being judged. And therefore, we can aid our parents in the event that they have some sins that need to be cleansed in Gehenna. We know that it could be 12 months that they could potentially be there. And therefore, 12 months, we're saying Kaddish because someone after they've passed, they themselves can't do any mitzvahs, but their children they're like a spiritual extension of them of themselves, and therefore the child who does a mitzvah, child who does says Kaddish, child who testifies to God's total dominion, that can aid and that can assist the parent potentially going through a challenging cleansing process in Gehenna. 
Now, traditionally, we only actually say it for 11 months because we don't assume that our parents are that bad, that they need the full, you know, the, the full regime of 12 months. They, they, maybe 11 months. Some people have a custom say 12 months, but others say, no, we'll just, we'll just, we'll just, we'll just do the, uh, the 11 months. We assume that, you know, at least there is some righteousness and meritoriousness and therefore we'll say just the 12 months. Now, why does it take a year to be cleansed in Gehenim? So I have my own theory. Talmud tells us that there are 248 positive mitzvos. If you count the times that the Torah tells us do something, 248 different commandments, whereas with the negative commandments, 365. Says the Talmud, equal to the days in a solar year. Now what that means, I don't know. But isn't it interesting? Talmud tells us there's 365 days in the solar year. 365 corresponding sins. When you are cleansed from your sins, it takes 365 days. Maybe each day there is a judgment for a given sin. And therefore the maximum, someone does all 365 sins, well then they'll need 365 days to be purged, to be cleansed from all of those sins. Maybe, who knows? But interestingly, when the Mishnah is talking about post-mortem spiritual cleansing, it says, according to the uh, the original opinion, 365 days, 12 months. And then we have this dissenting opinion. No, it's not 12 months. It's 50 days between Pesach and Shavuos. What this is revealing to us is that the power of these days are for cleansing and purging. When we look at the concept of Gehenna, and I want to talk about it, of course, it's a big subject, and it's um, one that people are, people get heated, pardon the pun, about, and one that people are very intrigued about. Maybe we'll schedule that when we talk about the 13 principles, because it does appear in the principles. When we talk about this idea, the idea of someone going to a place called Gehenna to cleanse their sins, it's very important for us to remember this is not God getting revenge. This is someone, a soul, that its natural destination is to be in close proximity of, with God. And therefore, as a result, it has to be fitting, it has to be ready for such a stature. And a sin sullies souls. A sin sullies the souls. So if something in their soul needs to be cleaned, it has to be power washed, it has to be cleansed before they can achieve their ultimate destiny of being close to God. And our sages tell us, what time is most propitious for soulful cleansing? The days spanning Pesach, and Shavuos, the days of the Omer, the days of the Sphira. Like we said, it's the polishing of our sapphire. Our soul is like a sapphire. Sometimes it gets some smudges. Sometimes it gets some alloys. We need to polish it. When's the best time to do that? The best time to do that is right now. It's a lot better. It's a lot more pleasant to do that now and not have to wait and to endure the Gehenna. Let's do it now, and specifically at the time that is most designed for that. Think about it. The Jewish people, they leave Egypt. What are they? They're a nation that is has spent a lot of time surrounded by idolaters. And some of those mores filter and, and practices filtered into their behavior. And now what's going to happen? They're going to have prophecy at Sinai? How's that going to happen? you got to cleanse. You gotta make yourself a vessel worthy of that experience. And therefore, that theme is central to these days. And therefore, during these days, we are tasked as well with preparing, cleansing ourselves from our sins, from our impurities, from our spiritual alloys, and prepare our soul for Sinai and cleanse our soul from any hiccups, any past misdeeds.
there is another theme of these days. And again, it's another theme, but it's interrelated, but it's another dimension of, of how to look at these days. The Torah frames the days of the Omer, the counting of the Omer, as the bridge, as the continuum connecting two offerings brought in the temple. One of them is a barley meal offering that's brought on the second day of Pesach. And one of them is a wheat loaf offering, the two loaves of bread, corresponding, of course, to the two tablets, the tablets of testimony, the tablets of Sinai that's brought on Shavuos. And the commentaries point out that there's a difference between barley and wheat. Both of them, of course, are grains. Both of them, of course, have gluten. One of the five grains, both of them are are part of that group of five grains that contain gluten. But there's a difference between the two. The Talmud tells us that barley is considered animal feed. It's animal fodder. It's food for animals. And wheat... On the other hand, it's considered food for humans. And even today, wheat is uh, is a much more dignified food. And therefore, that is highlighting the transformation of what's happening between the Jewish people subjugated to Pharaoh and the Jewish people subjugated, submitting themselves to God. We were like animals to a certain degree. We have this barley within us, this barley food that we're testifying, that's us. And over the course of these days of the Omer, we're upgrading ourselves to bring the wheat and to bring the human food, so to speak, because now over the course of these days, physiologically, we're trying to change ourselves and say, okay, you know, an animal has a body, a human has a body. So where is the difference? The difference is only in the soul. And to a certain extent, in Egypt, we were like an animal. We were living as bodies. Our soul, which is innately subjugated to God, it was dormant. It wasn't operating within us. And that's why we couldn't have had prophecy. And over the course of these days, we are unearthing and elevating and raising to prominence our latent, holy, angelic soul. And that, of course, is what defines us, what makes us as A human is that, not the body. And once our soul is present, of course, our soul can very easily, very naturally have a commune, have a conversation, have prophecy with God. And therefore, that represents this transformation from beast to angel that happened, of course, with the Jewish people at the Exodus to Sinai. And of course, we're trying to recreate that each year during the days of the Omer. But there's a deeper level to this point. The barley offering is a very rare phenomenon. There's only two offerings of all the offerings. There's many, many offerings. Read, of course, Leviticus, all kinds of sacrifices, and some of them are offerings offerings of uh, flour, grain, breads, matzahs. Only two of them are made out of barley, are made out of animal fodder. And they are the one that's brought every year on the second day of Pesach, the Omer offering. And the second barley offering is brought by a suspected adulteress, by a sota. A woman is suspected of adultery. Many laws, of course, governing how exactly, you know, what the criteria uh, for that law to be to be in place. But she brings an offering during the process of the protocol of the Sota. And then you have something brought of wheat and that is brought on on Shavuos. There's a deep insight here. The Sota, of course, is the suspected adulteress, is the woman who has been acting unfaithfully, who has rebelled, so to speak, against the union. Jewish people They're in Egypt. Where do they come from? They come from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the founders, the pillars of this relationship, people that were close to God more than anyone else in history. And what happens? They descend to Egypt, both geographically and spiritually. They become indistinguishable from their Egyptian neighbors. They become sinners. They become idolaters. They become people who rebel against God. And what happens? 
we have to uplift them with the Exodus. And of course, the Exodus is temporary, day one. Day two, realize where you where you're holding. You're at the level that is paralleling the sota, the suspected adulteress. You have rebelled. You have refused to recognize where you come from, to recognize your origin. There is a fascinating teaching in the Talmud. Of course, it's talking about something entirely different, but it may be related to this point. The Talmud is brought down several places. One of them is in the book of Baruchos, page 40a. It's asking the question, what was the fruits of the tree of knowledge? We know the story, Adam and Eve, they eat from the fruits, forbidden fruits, and everything changes. What was the fruit? So we're told in popular culture it was an apple. Well, was it? Talmud says maybe not. Talmud brings three opinions as to what it was. According to Rabbi Meir, it was a vine. Why? Because nothing brings as much wailing as the vine. That's the first opinion. Comes along Rabbi Nechemia and says, no, it was a fig. Why? Because later on, they're trying to cover up their nakedness with fig leaves, and it's appropriate to try to rectify the sin with the sin itself. And therefore, they sin with the fig and try to fix it with the fig. That's what Rabbi Nechemia says. Comes along Rabbi Judah, Rabbi Yehuda, and he says, no, it was wheat. Why? Because a child does not recognize their parents until they start eating bread, until they start eating wheat. And therefore, this is called the tree of knowledge. And therefore, what gives someone knowledge? It's the bread, it's the wheat. That's what Talmud says. Now, obviously, if we are if we were trained to know how to process teachings in the Talmud, we know there's a lot going on over here. And there's a lot of things beneath the surface. But isn't it interesting that the Talmud describes wheat as the food that when a child has it, it's associated with recognizing their parents, with recognizing their origin. Maybe we could suggest Jewish people in Egypt, we forgot our origin. We forgot where we came from. We forgot our destiny, our history, our what were the foundations of our people. We forgot Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We forgot the role that we're supposed to play in, in history. We became like the Egyptians. We rebelled against that. We became like the suspected adulteress. And that, of course, marks the beginning of this transformation. What does the end look like? At the end, we're no longer eating the barley. We're no longer eating the food or presenting the food that is related to to rebellion, now it's the food that's related to recognizing your parents, so to speak, recognizing your origin, knowing where you came from, and knowing what you stand for. I saw a very interesting calculation. How many days are we counting between Pesach and Shavuos during the Omer? So, of course, you read the verse, you're counting 49 days. Seven weeks, each week is comprised of seven days, seven times seven, Seven squared, 49 days. However, as we mentioned earlier, the way that this counting is done is a little bit unusual. You don't just count the days. You count the days and then you say, well, let's do the math. If today is 10 days in the Omer, then it's one week because each week is seven days. And it's also three more days. So you would say today is the 10th day of the Omer. That's one counting. And a second counting is, which is one week and three days. So every day is counted twice, with the exception of day one, because there's no weeks. Day two, three, four, five, six, there's no weeks, right? Because there's no weeks yet. Day seven, you say today's the seventh day, which is one week in the Omer. So from day seven and on, you count twice. So you have six days where you count once, and then 43 days for the total of 49, where you count twice. So how many times are we counting? How many days are we counting? Well, let's do a little bit of math. If for 43 days of the 49 days, we count twice, because you count today's day seven, one counting, which is one week, a second counting. Today's day eight, one counting, right, three, which is one week and one day. Again, another counting. So 43 times two is 86, plus six, the first six days we count only once, a total of 92 days that we count. 
Interesting law. A woman who gets divorced or whose husband dies, of course, she's now a free agent. She can marry whomever she wants, almost whomever she wants. However, the law states that she has to wait before she gets married. So a woman gets divorced today, she can't get married tomorrow. Why? Because what's going to be in nine months there's a baby, we don't know who the dad is. Because today she's married to person A, tomorrow she's married to person B, and we have no idea who the, you know, who the paternity is because, of course, you know, if once if they're actually legally married, maybe there's some conflict, but so what? If they're legally married, we assume that there is a potential of intercourse there. And therefore, if, if the marriages, if the husbands are too close to each other, we're not going to differentiate between this father and that father. We're not going to know the paternity. That's what the Talmud says. Well, how long do you have to wait? It says the Talmud, you got to wait 90 days because with 90 days, after three months, you can already tell that someone's pregnant. So we'll be able to differentiate between husband A and husband B. We'll know who the father is. However, the law states that it's 90 days not including the day of the divorce or the day of the new marriage. So really, it's 92 days between both unions. Isn't it interesting? Jewish people, initially with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we had a union with God. We had a pact with God. We go to Egypt and we renege on our commitments. We abandon God. We rebel. We seek other deities. We become like the Egyptians. We worship their gods. and We behave like them in every way, almost every way. We're wedded to the Egyptian gods. Sinai is the day of the wedding, of the marriage, of the union between the Jewish people and God. And I just saw this very interesting calculation. Just as when one marital union is dissolved, you have to wait 92 days before a new union can be consummated, so too. Isn't it interesting? We have this very unusual way of counting. Today is 10 days, which is, okay, let's do the math. You know, Jews are not, we're known for maybe being more creative, but the math is a little challenging for us. Come on. Today's 10 days, which is one week plus three days? No, we're actually counting 92 days because we're trying to indicate that what's actually happening here is a absolvement of one union and the consummation of the union that we have with God. And again, that matches this idea of we were like the Soto, we were rebellious against God, and, and now we recognize our origin. We have that barley to we transformation, and that is similar to the absolvement, the annulment of one union and the consummation of a new one. And there's another theme in these days, namely the period of mourning for the students of Rabbi Akiva. The Talmud tells us Rabbi Akiva was a great scholar and he had an academy and the academy numbered 24,000 students, but they all died because they didn't treat each other with the requisite respect, the requisite honor. And the world was empty until Rabbi Akiva had five more students. And these five students Gave, it the rest, gave us the rest of the Torah. They are Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Judah, Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Shimon, and Rabbi Elazar ben Shamua. When did they die? So Thomas tells us the book of Yevamos, page 62b, they died from Pesach to Shavuos. Now, the 33rd day of the Omer is a day when they stop dying. And therefore, that's a mini celebration or mini holiday because we have the mourning period, and then we have this one day of respite, this oasis where they stop dying. And as a result, even though these days are very positive days, we're building from, from Pesach to Shavuos, we're changing ourselves, we're upgrading, we're cleansing, we're purging, we are transforming ourselves, but there is a custom for us to adopt a certain degree of mourning. We don't get haircuts, we don't shave, we don't schedule weddings for this time, because it is a day of mourning. How does this relate to what's happening on Pesach to Shavuos on the Omer, the, the general theme of the Omer? So I think 
there's a deep connection between these days. Of course, Rabbi Kiva represents Torah. His students represent Torah. These days represent preparation for Torah. When we talk about preparation for Torah, we're indicating that not everyone, not anyone, is an appropriate receptacle, an appropriate repository, an appropriate vessel of Torah. We have to make ourselves into someone that's worthy of having Torah. These students, students of Rabbi Kiva, they didn't treat each other with the requisite respect. And therefore, they died. And they died at this time, at the time that we are trying to prime ourselves, to prepare ourselves, at the time where historically our ancestors did prepare themselves for Torah, this is the time where people who are not worthy of harboring Torah are weeded out, so to speak. They didn't have proper respect for each other. And therefore, as a result, they died at this time where people have to choose, am I going to be someone who is worthy of receiving Torah or am I going to choose to be someone who's not worthy of receiving Torah? The Jewish people historically, they said, yes, we're in. Where do I sign? How do I prepare? 49 days to get ready. Students of Rabbi Kiva, they didn't treat each other with the proper respect and consequently they perished in this time. Maybe one of the most famous comments in Rashi and all of Torah when it talks about the Jewish people encamping by Mount Sinai, Vayichan Sham Yisrael Negadahar. The Jewish people are described in singular terms, not in plural terms. The singular nation encamped at Mount Sinai. Says Rashi, Ki Ishechad Belevechad. Like one man with one heart with one purpose. The Jewish people were totally united at Sinai. In fact, our sages tell us that if you count the letters of the Torah, the 600,000 letters of the Torah, one corresponding to each soul that was at Sinai. And just as if you have a Torah that's missing even one letter, the whole Torah is invalidated, so too, if the Jewish people, if there was one person that was not on board, they wouldn't have been worthy to receive the Torah. You have a disparate nation, a nation of a bunch of individuals over the course of these 50 days are being welded together into a single indivisible entity, a nation, a nation united as one person, a nation that could be described in singular terms, a nation with one purpose, a nation with one mission, a nation with one goal. Okay, this is the nation that could receive Sinai. Rabbi Kiva students, they don't treat each other with respect. The only reason why you would not respect someone else is because you view them as an external entity, as someone who is not you. This is a foreigner. This is an alien. This is an other. And therefore, you are demonstrating, or the students were demonstrated, that they were not cut out for Torah. And therefore, at the time where people have to choose, are they cut out or are they not cut out? They died because they didn't treat each other with the requisite respect. There's 49 days for us to get ready. In the Mishnah Perke Avos, Rabbi Yochanan Medzakai sends his five students, or five primary students, on a mission, fact-finding mission. Go find out what's the best characteristic of all of them. And each one of them comes back with their findings. And ultimately, the student who says, Lev Tov, a good heart, that's the student that Rabbi Yochum Zachar says, you're right. Lev Tov, a good heart. A good heart incorporates all the characteristics of the nation. The Jewish people were like one man with one heart. Over the course of these 49 plus 150 days of getting ready for Sinai, they acquire the trait of a good heart. The gematria of the word lave, heart, 32. The word tov, 17. The total is, of course, 49. These 49 days are 49 days for us to acquire the lave of the good heart, to become worthy of being one nation, one man with one heart, and being ready for Sinai. And thus, this brings us to our final theme, there's got to be a special emphasis on 
viewing the other positively, of trying to find the good, trying to see the good in another person, trying to have goodness exuding from your good heart to try to create unity between you and your brethren, to try to remove division and schism and factionalism and fractionalism between you and others and to try to unite as much as possible to become ready for Sinai. Yes, there are some contradicting themes of this day. On one hand, we're told it's days of mourning, right? When Kiva students died. On the other hand, it's days of preparation, days of anticipation, days of joy with the pending celebration, with the pending matrimony. I think, in effect, we're given a choice. Which kind of experience do we want to have over the course of these 49 days? Do we want to be the people who are building, who are continuing the process of the Exodus, trying to unlock as much redemption and freedom as possible, taking what we've earned on Pesach and trying to continue it to earn Shavuos as well, to prepare, to anticipate, to count, to await, and to build towards that day, to purify ourselves, to polish the sapphire that we have within us, to take the barley, the beast food, and try to turn it into the man food, to turn it into the wheat, to unearth the soul that we have within us, to take the rebellious nature of the sota, of the adulteress, so to speak, and to become like the child who knows how to recognize their parents with the wheat? Are we going to have that special emphasis of welding together as a nation, becoming that good heart? Or are we going to suffer the fate, so to speak? Are we going to try to live these days as the students of Rabbi Kiva? And then these days are days of mourning. So these are some of the themes, seven themes. Like I said, they're, they're all related. They're all interconnected. But these are very powerful, important days. It's not just an isolated mitzvah. Let's just count days. It's not like you know the, the, the Torah has an inefficient calendar. We need to outsource the counting to everyone else or else we'll just lose the count. Of course not. There's very powerful meaning behind these days. These are days of, or capable of at least, tremendous personal growth and transformation. Like we said, there is a custom to study the laws or the book of the chapters of our fathers to prepare ourselves. And if we do it properly, we do it correctly, hopefully we all will, we will be prepared better than ever for Sinai, for Torah. We'll be united as a nation. We'll have that good heart, our sapphire will gleam, will be shiny, will just be bursting with life, and we will be ready for the grand matrimony of Sinai on the Festival of Shavuos at the end of this 50 Days of Transformation. My email address, as always, is rabbiwobajima.com. I look forward to hearing from you. Any questions or comments or feedback of any kind.